So ICX switching, um, we've, we've seen this slide before, so I'm not going to go over it again. The other thing is, within the ICX portfolio, while the primary product that has been installed to schools as part of the equipment replacement program is the 7150 as an edge switch, uh, within our Ruckus portfolio, we do have higher end switches as well. And so some schools require features such as a core switch with like 12 or 24 fiber ports. Um, the 7150, the maximum number of fiber ports that the 7150 range provides, most of them only have four fiber ports on the, 12 and, uh, on the 2448s. But then there is a model, and we'll talk about this a bit later, which has eight fiber ports. But beyond that, uh, if you need like more fiber ports, you'll need to go up to 7550, 7650, or 7450. So what we have seen so far in the deployment of schools is that some schools, uh, if, you, if you require more than eight fiber links at your core, then you're probably going to be on a 7450, 7550, or 7650, depending on stock availability and what would suit your school best. Yeah. Which one has the modules at the back? That's the 7450, which I don't have on the slide, I'm sorry. Yeah. Is there the advantages? Yeah, and okay, so the 75, we have a model of 7550, which is 24 ports of 10 gig fiber. The 7650, the same model is a 48 port, but it's 10 gig, sorry, it's, it's 24 ports of 10 gig and 24 ports of 1 gig, which is actually kind of useless, right? I mean, no one really needs, for what we're doing, no one is requiring 24 ports of 1 gig fiber. Uh, so if you're going to 7650, you're going to be using it because uh, you're just going to be utilizing the 24 ports of 10 gig fiber. Those other 1 gig ports though, you can put a copper module in there and you can have 24 copper ports on that switch for things like connecting 1 gig servers and stuff like that. Yep. But once again, with the, uh, the, the 7550, 24, you could put yes, copper modules. 10 gig copper? Yes, absolutely. Yep. They all do. Uh, there is a limitation with that though. Uh, it, with our 10 gig uh, copper module, I think it's 30 meters is the limitation because there's a limited power output with those modules. Could you yep. stack two 7150s if you wanted to have like eight? You absolutely could. If you wanted to use that as a backbone? Yeah, keep in mind that the stacking actually consumes one of those ports on each switch. Uh, so your eight ports will decrease to, yeah, exactly right. Sorry, say again? It's one port on each switch. Uh, it depends what you do, actually. You're right. Uh, you could do a, a, a linear or a ring topology. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Then, you'd need, then you'd need two ports to connect. The, if you had three switches, you'd want to connect one to two and then one to three. You'd make a ring, right? Yeah. Do you have, um, like, 40 gig stacking? Or? Yep, sure yep. do. Yep. Yeah. And when stacking, is that restricted to one link? between each switch unit? No, you can have multiple links for so stacking. if you wanted to, and you were just using two, two um, switches, and you wanted to stack the hell of them, yep. you could put four, four links. You're consuming more two. ports, but you absolutely could. Yeah. Um, so so what, let me just show you a couple of... Speed, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no, it's speed, yeah. So let me show you a couple of scenarios. Um, so one scenario is with the 7150 family. Uh, so with 7150, you've got the... Uh, four ports on, on the side, which are all the 10 gig ports we use for stacking. These ports could be stacking ports or they could be fiber uplink ports to another part of the school. Um, now, if you want, you could take, a, take one link, go from here to here, and I've got myself a stack and I'm consuming one port on each switch, leaving me three ports on that switch and three ports on that switch I could use for uplinking to other places. Uh, at that point, if I wanted more bandwidth, I could absolutely put a second link between here and here. Now I'm consuming two ports on each switch, and I do have, though, 20 gigabits of bandwidth now between those two switches. The other scenario would be if I had more than two switches. So if I have more than two switches... So in the two-switch scenario, I think we call this a linear topology, where we basically just have that one link going between these two switches. For most people, there's no point in, ha in having more than one link, right? 10 gig is normally enough for most people going between two switches. Um, what you can do then is you can connect, connect the third switch. 
Now, if the middle switch fails in this scenario, switch one and switch three cannot communicate to each other. So what you can do is you can create a ring and you can bring it back round so that if the middle switch fails, switch one and two can still communicate with each other. So there's all sorts of different topologies that are supported when we're doing stacking. So keep in mind that it has to be the fastest port on the switch. If yeah, you want good to point. Stack. So, so when we do stacking on a ruckus switch, um, these, these four optical ports that we have, or SFP ports that we have on the switches, um, are able to operate at one gigabit or 10 gigabit. And in fact, we actually require an additional license for these ports to operate at 10 gigabit. The stacking is free, you get two ports free. Uh, on our base product, you actually don't. Uh, on the product that they're procuring as part of the equipment replacement, yes, that's true. Ten, ten, two ports are upgraded to 10 gig uh, out of the box. But when you purchase a, a ruckus switch, it is possible to purchase a base model which has all one gig ports. This is like a little secret though. and uh, Some people know this. Our licensing for our upgrade to 10 gig, there's no license keys. You just run a command, which is like... The two port, four port. Yeah. Times out after 45 days. It actually doesn't. Uh, it tells you it will, but it doesn't. Um, so, so what it says... Tells you it does. Yeah. So, so what it says is, is when you run install license perpetual, it comes up with this thing saying, if you've purchased a license, then all well and good, push yes. If you want a 45-day trial, push yes too, but please disable after 45 days. Uh, um, <laughs> so it's more of an honor system. Yeah. <laughs> I think we're at radio switches. <laughs> yeah. so, but, man, hello, yeah. There's a ministry for this equipment replacement program, and they're going to be specifying this equipment, are they? Yeah, absolutely. So as part of the upgrade process in schools, the team at Network for Learning uh, work with the ministry to create a design uh, for the school. Uh, and as part of that process, they will come up with a recommendation as to which equipment should be installed and where. And then they'll give that list to the school and they'll go, hey, here's our proposal. How's it going to affect you with the schools that are going with fibre to the classrooms? Directly? The other system. Yeah, because I've got that happening yeah. shortly. So, yeah, so, so for schools that are part of the, uh, what do we call that program? Passive Optical Land. Passive Optical Land. land. Uh, yeah. Is it still in oh, trial phase, yeah. pilot? Yeah. Yep. So for schools who are part of the pond pilot, it's my understanding that they don't have ruckus switches and you're just 100% reliant on the pond equipment that's being provided to the school. They are, they are ruckus core switch. Right, ruckus core switch. Ruckus APs, yep. so you may have AT yep. from the earlier ones. Yep, got it. So generally speaking though, because they have the ONTS all around the school, you yeah. shouldn't really require a switch. So what was that about a core switch? Did they have a core switch? They do need a core. Ruckus core switch. Yep. Um, when you're stacking switches, so if you were to put um, say, say if you had more than three switches, say you had a stack mm -hmm. of five, yep. you're using a ring topology. Yep. Uh, is there any degradation that is noticeable when doing stacking five, or would it be beneficial to stack a three and a two? No, uh, so we support 12. Uh, yep. so, so you could do 12. Less. So uh, it's bandwidth. Yeah. Um, yeah. It all depends on your expected bandwidth utilization. Like, you know, if I've got a... And it's, let's, yeah, it's go also loop-free, right? So Yeah. Yeah. So let's say I've got a 10 gig server plugged into this other port that's not being used. And I want that guy to communicate to a server which is connected at 10 gig on this port. And if we're expecting the utilization between these two servers to be 10 gig near all the time, then that will consume all of your stacking bandwidth. Um, so you do just have to factor in, you know, what, what other connections do I have? The reality is most people, because the, the, all the other ports on these switches are one gigabit ports, and the reality is that most people will never exceed 10 gig on the uplink. But if you do have some kind of special use case where you've got a 10 gig device plugged in here, or another 10 gig device plugged in at some point else within that ring, then you could consume the stacking bandwidth. Excellent. So, look, primarily the 7150 is, is the product that we should all be familiar with because that's the edge switch that's been rolled out. And then we have the core switches, 7450, 7550, 76. We had a question regarding the 7450. Sorry, I don't have a slide. But the other thing is some of these switches are modular, especially once we get up into here. And so the 7550 switch 
uh, now I could be wrong, no, uh, this is right. The 7550 and the 7650 both have one single module on the front of the switch uh, for expansion. And we allow you to put a 40 or 100 gigabit QSFP module into here to add additional ports. Uh, actually, I think I have a slide which explains. Do I have a slide explaining the module? module slide? Mm. It might be in the next slide deck, maybe. Mm. Yeah, I think I have a slide that explains it. Um, however, the 7450, which is a model which is not listed on this slide, has three modules. The, so the 7450 switch has a module on the front, and on the rear of the 7450 has two modules. Now there are three types of module that can be put into the switch. So the most common module is a four times 10 gig module, uh, 10 GR. And so a four times 10 gig module allows us to get 12 usable fiber ports out of the 7450. This is quite a good switch in terms of the fact that it's cost effective, he's but he's right for years. Yeah, exactly. But um, and it's quite, it's available at the moment as well. So we have had some supply issues with switches, um, and the seventy four fifty for a long time was the most we had the most stock of this switch. Um, the issue with the seventy four fifty is this is the rear of the switch, and so eight of your fiber ports with the seventy four fifty, eight of your cables must be routed around to the back of your rack and plugged into the rear of the switch. Which is not ideal, but it's yeah, it's, it's, not, it's not a helpful intro to top five. No, uh, but you know, it's it's not a bad switch. It, you know, it, that's the only limitation really that it has is the fact that the ports are on the rear of the switch. Do your switches take encryption modules? This one does. Yeah, the seventy four fifty has a uh, IP IPsec encryption module. Yeah, and I think we have some slides on that actually. All right, so high level summary of some of the features we have within the rack of switches. So 12 switches in a stack. You can actually do stacking over long distance. If you use a fiber cable, you can put switches 10 kilometers apart and have them in the same stack. I don't understand why you'd want to do that, but you could. Uh, it's hitless failover, so if you have a, a, a switch fail in the stack, it'll keep working. All the other switches will continue to function. The controller, so one of the, the switch member unit is nominated as a controller. So what will happen is if you have the controller fail, when I say controller, I mean switch controller. If the switch controller fails, a new unit will be nominated as the master and it will continue to pass traffic. Switches and ruckus access points come with a limited lifetime hardware warranty. So if we stop selling the switch today, for a further five years, we will replace the switch free of charge. The same applies for the access points. We have this technology within ruckus switching called campus fabric. Now this is a technology that we're not really recommending to schools because there are a significant number of limitations with this technology. Campus fabric basically means that you have to have a couple of high-end core switches. So the 7850 and the 7650 are the only two switches that could be a campus fabric controller. What it does is it allows us to connect 36 additional switches and no more than 36 and they become logical units off the control bridge. And so what we end up with is a single configuration file for all of our switches on campus. But there are a number of limitations to campus fabric technology, uh, and that's why it hasn't really been deployed in schools. So we've got the standalone versus stacking versus campus fabric. We've spoken about the PoE already today, uh, and not really relevant, but the switches also support open flow as well which is a data collection standard, which is really, really common in switching. All right, I think maybe uh, we're going to go through ICX CLI. I have some slides, but in a moment we'll rely on Adam to help us out as well. The Ruckus switch command line is all standard. Regardless of which model of switch you're using, it's the same command line. Uh, so I know with the Alitalysis switches, like if you go to like an 8000 GS and then you move to like a, an X510 or something like that, it's quite a different command line yes. and you have to kind of get yeah. familiar with it. But with Ruckus switches, it's a common command line across all switches. And it's, I would describe it as a cross between like Cisco and HP if I had to compare it to another vendor. Uh, but basically we have these different permission levels, right? So you've got the user exec level where you can't do much. Then you type the enable command and it gets you into the privilege level. 
And if you want to do some damage, then you type the config terminal command and you can actually get into configuration mode. Now the, the level at which you're at is obviously represented by your command prompt. So this here tells us we're in configuration mode. This is enable mode. Um, do you want to show us real quick, Adam? Uh, maybe you could go back to the user mode. So we're in a switch here. This is our 12 port switch up the front. Uh, so this is, we just logged in. We've got a prompt that looks like this. Uh, and then we go enable and that should turn on the, the hash symbol. And then we can go config terminal and that will put us into config mode. Cool. And obviously we can do command abbreviations, kind of just like all major vendors do. Instead of typing configuration terminal, you can just go config T. Uh, and, and yeah. You can also tab it out. So yep. tab completion. Type captive, you just push tab and it'll complete it for you. Yep. So very, very standard, I guess. Yep. Uh, what else do we have in our slides here? Yeah, so these are our different prompts. And now let's talk about the interface assignment. I think I have a slide which details the interfaces. I might jump around a little bit. So this here is a Ruckus 7250, which is a product we don't sell anymore. I just need to update the slides. Um, in this switch, it has two modules. So what we have here, module one, is, are the fixed copper ports, and module two are the SFP plus ports. Now in the 7150 product range, this 12 port switch actually has three modules. It has 12 ports, which are uh, one gigabit copper ports. Then it has an additional two ports here. Then there are another additional two ports, which are the SFP plus ports. This is a 12 port switch, but it's in fact a 16 port switch. On Ruckus switches, whether it be the 24, 48 or 12 port, all ports are active at the same time. You guys remember with the Alitalysis 8000 GS, you, it's a combo. You could only use the fiber or the copper, and you couldn't use them both at the same time. Yeah. So it's a bit different with the ruckus switches. All the ports are able to be consumed and utilized at the same time. Um, and so the, the numbering that we have for our interfaces inside of the configuration is uh, like this. So it's the switch number in the stack. So if we have a stack, that would be, for example, switch two would be like two by one by one. And so that's the stack number, that's the module number, and then that's the port number. Pretty standard stuff. I think a lot of vendors do the same thing. I think we may, maybe we'll do some VLANs. Adam, do you want to show us how to create a VLAN on the switch? Mm. So to create a VLAN, it's quite easy. You just type VLAN and then the number, and that creates the VLAN. Uh, the main difference with us and other vendors is if you want to assign that VLAN to an interface, you have to do it within the VLAN and not the actual port interface. So if you want to assign VLAN 10, for example, you type, say, untagged Ethernet, uh, and then 1, 1, let's say 5. And now it says it's been assigned to VLAN 10. So we've just made port 5 on that switch. Uh, an untagged member of VLAN 10, yep. which means that yeah, it'll it'll just function only in VLAN 10. If you wanted to do a block, how would you like to? Do Great question. Yep. Yep. So what you can do is you can do ranges and you can do multiple selections. So if you wanted to do like VLAN 200 to 300, that's 100 VLANs. So that would create 100 VLANs on the switch straight away. What about that port it's now level? Now creating all these VLANs. <laughs> <laughs> that's okay. Yeah. Um, so that, that creates 100 VLANs, and then you can assign it to a specific interface, and it'll apply 100 VLANs to that. Yep. You probably want to do what it tagged. you wanted to do multiple ports to that same port Yep, VLAN. so you can do it the same way. So you just, within that VLAN yeah. range, you just type interface um, port number to port number. So what if you, if you go into a VLAN for us, like maybe go into our VLAN 10 that we created, and then uh, if we wanted to make untagged, let's say we wanted to have ports 2 to 4, untagged so we could go so that's a range we use the two command but yep. as well as that we could append another thing to the end of that right and we could yep. do another uh, let's say we also wanted port uh, nine or six or something we can also just add oh, I think oh. we have to do ethernet okay so whenever you're working with a range you have to define the range as the full start the full finish not yep. just 
um, unit one, module one. Yeah, you've got to go one, one, one to. Yeah, okay. yeah. yeah. So, yeah, if what you can also do is um, if you want to do like VLAN 20, 30, 40, uh, then that will highlight three different VLANs. And then even more, you could do VLAN 10 to 20 and then 30, 40. So you can do that as well. And you can also do that with the ports. So, Could you maybe do a show VLAN command and we'll have a look at what VLANs are created on this switch? <laughs> uh, yeah, okay, maybe we won't go it's through long. them all because you've created 100. Is there like a show prelim brief or yeah. set? Yep, so if you want to see like the ports, show and brief. do that. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, you can do you know, show running config and it'll tell you like everything. And it'll tell you which um, interfaces are assigned to those VLANs as well and whether it's like tagged or untagged. And if we wanted to delete a VLAN, if we wanted to delete VLAN 10, we would just go no VLAN 10. Yeah, unless it's... Yeah. And then any yeah. ports that were assigned to that VLAN will be reverted back to the default VLAN. Yeah, which uh, it's cool because some vendors, they'll, they'll be really specific. So you'll need to unassign the interface from the VLAN before you can remove the VLAN and things like that. So. Can you use all? Do you have an all? All? Like all VLAN? All ports, all VLANs? Yeah. But no, you could just do like VLAN 1, 2, range. 4, yeah, on 4095. Sorry. Tag a port to all VLANs, so when they're added and removed, they're automatically Got tagged to that update. Uh, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah there, is, there is the all because I use that when I configure those full switches. So I think if you, if you configure it as like a trunk port, that kind of does the same thing. You right? can set a native, uh, sorry, a default native. VLAN. Yeah. Which means that any new port that's not configured will be in your defined default VLAN. Yeah. But, uh, yeah. And then um, if you really want, I mean, you can get into like double tag VLANs as well. So you can do Q and Q if you really wanted to do that. But uh, I think most people tend to just use dot one Q. Yeah. So how about the uh, config? So let's look at that real quick. Um, now, so just like most switches, uh, we use write mem to save the config. Oh, save the config? So if you go write mem, yep. that will save the config. Pretty straightforward stuff. Um, and you can do that from any location. Yeah. Uh, oh, I'll show you. So you can see like the, all the config files in there, and you can see how big they are. Um, you can see the primary and secondary images. So what else could we do? Show flash. So is it created back up automatically if it's on your site? No, you'd have to do it yourself as an administrator. I think someone has done that manually. But, uh, yeah. Awesome. Yeah. 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 But the smart zone does keep switch back up. Can we talk about that shortly? Um, and then from there, this is where you can see the two different software banks. So we've got a primary and secondary. Um, if you look at quite closely, so the primary is set with SPS, and the SPS is how you tell whether a switch, it's using switch, conf switch firmware or not. Um, SPR means it's using the routed firmware, so it's layer three. Do you remember earlier in the day how I told you guys a switch is layer three capable? Yeah. So we have a layer two and a layer three software image. And so out of the box, the primary image is the switching firmware, and the, the secondary image is the routing firmware. And so as Adam says, uh, in, in one of uh, one of our banks, we've got switching, the other banks, we've got routing. And there's a command that you can run, which is, I think it's set boot ID, and you can just change your boot to the other image and reboot, and then you'll be in layer three mode. So you'll need that to jump between VLANs on the switch? If you want to route between VLANs, then yes. So when you switch from um, layer two to layer switch, three, yep. do you keep your config? Or does you do. It all yep. You keep the config, but as you're alluding to, there is a syntax difference uh, between the config for a layer two, layer three. So for example, to set the IP address on the switch, in layer two mode, there's a command which is IP address, and that's the management IP address for the switch. But as you know, within layer three, you have to have an IP address for each VLAN. Yeah. Um, and so when you boot the first time after changing from layer two to layer three, there's some conversion process that happens. And it gives you errors. It's like warning the IP address command is not supported now because you're on layer three. Please define your. So you really, really want to do that when you're connected to the switch rather than opening the link. Yeah, otherwise you'll lose your access, right? <laughs> yeah, for sure. Um, okay, so uh, managing the config file. So you can do a show running config that will show you what's running in memory. 
Show configurations interesting. Uh, that will show you the last saved configuration. So if you haven't saved recently, it'll show you like effectively the startup configuration. In Cisco land, I think they call it show startup config. Yeah. Um, and then obviously we have write me. Um, is there any way to show the difference between those two? Um, or are you forced to read through line by line and uh, from the switch UI, I uh, don't think so. But the smart zone can the smart zone can show yeah. you yes, but the not the switch itself. Yeah. yeah. Um, okay. So the other thing we could do is we could erase startup and reload. That's effectively doing a factory reset on the unit. So erase yeah. the startup config and reboot. We could change the host name for a switch. So the command prompt reflects the host name of the switch. So when you're logged in, you know which device you're logged into. Pretty straightforward stuff. And we've already discussed port numbering. I've jumped it around a bit here. So the show version command shows us the current running software image. Uh, so that's pretty straightforward. The PoE. PoE. I think they do pretty good interfaces. Yep. So we've kind of discussed the interface assignment. So if you want to do configuration at interface level, you would go into the interface by doing interface ethernet and you jump in. Uh, we have a disable enable command, which actually means the port won't link up if it's disabled. Uh, it's disabled, disabled, so device? No, it's actually independent. So yeah. PoE is independent of the ethernet connection. So it's possible for a port to be putting out power but not have a data connection. So you're just you're, you're just shutting down the layer two interface. Yeah. So it's probably no shutdown. It's kind of like no shutdown or shutdown and no shutdown, except it's called what is it? disable and enable. Yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah. yeah. Excellent. Uh, look, we we had an in-depth conversation around IPv4 versus v6. These switches do support IPv6, um, and that's how you would do that. Port naming is pretty neat. Do you want to show us how to name a port, Adam? So one of the things you can do is you can give a port a name. So if you've got a server plugged into a port, you could go, this is server number one. And when you do the uh, show interface brief, it'll give you a list of all the port names. So in this case, we're going to give port number one a, a name, and we're going to call it a port that goes to the Mac Mini. And now when we do show interface brief, we will see our, oh. our thing's not quite set right, but on the, on the side here uh, are all of our port names. So, so it allows us to actually make sense of what's plugged in. Can port names be done not only to a unique port, but to a port range or a port Absolutely. group? Absolutely, yeah. So you um, could do a range, and then you could do the port name command yeah. on the range. And can the range, the, uh, um, the name of a port or a group of ports, be used when configuring as well? When so configuring? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, other than just having a description of the port, can I say... Ah, uh, no, no, so you cannot... And say it's kind of like a free... And then rather than to type uh, in a port I understand what you're saying. What you're saying is can you uh, then address the port by the yep. name you've given it? No. Okay. However, if you do use this feature, this also filters through to the smart zone management console. So in a moment, we'll show you the smart zone, and all the port names are, are, are view, viewable in the GUI as well, which is quite nice. You can also name the thing name. Yeah, yep. good call. Yep. Yep. So as discussed, uh, the smart zone, as well as controlling the access points, can also control the switches, control, manage, and monitor. And this is how it looks in the smart zone. Previously, we saw we had the access point and the zone. So when it comes to switches, it's not called a zone, it's called a switch group. I don't know why we called it a switch group as opposed to a zone, but that's what it is. So we have a domain, which is obviously each school would have their own domain, and then residing inside of the domain is our switch group. It's possible to group switches together to apply common configuration. One thing to note is when you manage a switch in the smart zone, it won't download a firmware unless you do it later. So um, it won't put the switch out of service when you register to the smart zone. Yeah, good point. So you know, when you're connecting an AP to the smart zone, the AP's firmware is automatically the same version. Switches are not the same. 
Is there, is there any, at, at the moment, is there any variation in what Switch versions are supported? So the only consideration is you've got to be on a recent firmware version. Um, 809, 80, 90, 90 or something. Yeah, so yeah. 8090 and the above will generally support smart zone management, but we currently don't have this big matrix like the AP because it's a relatively new feature. In the future, yes, we probably will have, end up and having a big matrix. Is, is, that, is that version available on all switches that you have, or is there a range of switches that predate that version? No, it's available, available on all switches. Yeah. Except those really, really early brocade ones. Yeah, we don't sell those anymore, though. Yeah. So. There are some really old switches that are end of life, like a trillion years ago, and um, they won't support so the smart zone. If it says Rikos, it's compatible. Yeah. 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 Brocade, <laughs> Correct, yeah. Uh, so here we go. I mean, this is the answer to the question. So you've got to be on software version 8092 or newer on the switch in order to support smart zone management. So it's kind of the same. Uh, remember on the access point how we went set SCG IP? This is how you do it on the switch. Uh, the command is manager active list. And then you type in the IP address of the smart zone controller. Here's just an example of if you have a DHCP server. So you can actually use a Ruckus switch as your DHCP server. And if you do that, you can define option 43 in your DHCP server setup to tell the other switches and the access point where to find the smart zone. There is an order of preference. So by default, if an administrator has run the act manager active list command, that will take effect. But if that's in there, it won't do the DHCP lookup. If it's not there, DHCP would take place. Then we have this other list, which is a passive list. This is primarily used for like a backup zone director, oh, sorry, backup smart zone. If you've got a backup smart zone cluster, then you may also use the passive list command. So, can you, once it's in the smart zone, can you still make changes on the command line? Sure, yep. can. Yep. Yeah, uh, um, unlike the access points, so anything in the access points could get overwritten by the zone config. Um, anything you do independently on the switch and the CLI um, will just propagate and pass up into the smart zone, so it'll appear, yeah, so, and vice versa. So you can make changes on the smart zone and push it to the switch. Not too important, but this is the <coughs> registration process. Do you remember how we were talking about the access point establishing its connection to the smart zone? The switch does a similar thing. So it does an HTTPS connection to get a certificate, and then from that point onwards, it's using an SSH tunnel from the switch to the smart zone controller. So initially, when you connect a switch to the smart zone, here's what the UI looks like. It'll show you the switch has connected, and it will appear in the staging group. Now, administrators need to pick up the switch and move it to a, a real group. And once that takes place, the switch will then show as online. Um, can that also work based on what IP it's coming from? It can, yep. So we would expect that when Inferal does a full changeover, that if for any reason a switch fails and we need to pop a new one in there, that yep. would magically appear in our zone. Absolutely. Yep. Uh, there is a process if you were to replace a switch for a switch. Um, in the smart zone, you can select the, the old switch and it'll copy the config. And I, I presume because smart zone is an external um, application or a server, that when you make changes to a config and save it, it also stores that, that config as a backup in the smart zone. So if for any reason that switch failed before you could take a backup for it, you could just put a new switch in and say, this is replacing this, put the config onto yep. it. And would be as it was. Yeah. yeah. Perfect. Is our switch already connected to the smart zone? I believe so. We didn't remove it. So. We could do the show uh, show manager and just yeah. confirm what's going on. So this is our switch. I'll show you. See. I think that's the command for me. And if we might have to back out of this interface before we can do it. Oh no, there we go. Show manager status. Status, that's it. So show manager status tells us that our switch is connected via SSH to the controller. That's the controller's IP address. Yep. 